Welcome to the Recover You podcast with Kyleen and Patrick Terhune. It's here that we talk about sex addiction, betrayal trauma, mental, emotional, and physical health, faith, and anything and everything needed to recover you to your most authentic self that God created you to be. Welcome, welcome. We are back. We are back. And I don't know how long this is going to be because this is for the moment unprepared. This is episode whatever, point two. <laughs> no, we realized after the last two episodes that we forgot to mention hyperbaric. So we wanted to talk about that. Mm-hmm. And then we also realized that we have not talked about 90 days of celibacy yet. And so we wanted to share both of our perspectives on on that. So let's let's okay. start with hyperbaric. All right. So hyperbaric, um, and, and you can probably offer more more detail on this, but basically it's just you you sit in a hyperbaric chamber and you breathe pure oxygen. And so it has a lot of um healthy healing effects for your brain. And then it pressurizes. So pressurizes, you have yes. oxygen that you're breathing mm-hmm. in your nose, kind of hooked up, and then they pressurize the chamber. So it pushes all of the oxygen into your cells. Right. right. So if you <laughs> third week in a row, um, plugging Restore Hyper Wellness. Yes. If you, um, we're going to have to reach out to JJ and be yeah. like, hey, <laughs> we mentioned you three times. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you happen to go to someplace like that and get like a vitamin IV first, mm-hmm. and then you do hyperbaric, you're actually like pushing all of the nutrients into the cells. Right, right. And you don't have to do both at the same yeah. time, but. And so hy- hyperbaric is used for a lot of things. They, uh, the, um, I think one of the most famous uh patients is Joe Namath. Joe Namath was a ex NFL football player and played for the Jets and you know, famously predicted that his team would win the Super Bowl and they did, but you know, was really, you know, like a lot of those guys did. They, you know, they put their bodies on the line and stuff like that and had, you know, in essence brain injuries from it. And his I I think I had read somewhere, and I'm gonna get the details wrong in this, that he had done like 187 hyperbaric treatments and his brain had actually showed tremendous improvement in healing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And if so, you if right. you have a TBI, like mm-hmm. I'm I'm totally convinced that the two most dramatic things you could do is just a mega dose on omega threes mm-hmm. and be super serious and consistent about hyperbaric. Yeah. It has yeah. been shown to be so incredibly beneficial for the brain. Right, right. So I, I was doing it beforehand. It's actually a good wound healer too. Like if you have surgery or whatever, getting in the hyperbaric and stuff like that. But then um, after it was, you know, when we would go to restore, I always did an hour, hour plus in the hyperbaric. And I think it was, it was, you know, once again, it's a brain issue. So addiction is a brain issue. And you've got to, as you're going through all the patterns and recreating patterns and things like that, you got to help support the healing of the brain. So why not jumpstart it a little bit? And so yeah. hi- hyperbaric is one of those things that, that can absolutely do that for you. Yeah. I, I only did it for the first time very recently. Mm-hmm. And, and look I- at the improvement. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> Okay, but for you, what I find so funny is that you fall asleep in it every time. I did not get that mm-hmm. effect, even though I went in kind of sleeping. Yeah, well, that kind of happens to me when I lie when I lie horizontally. Anyway, oh, okay, yeah. all right, yeah. So anyway, plug restore hyper wellness. Absolutely, yeah. and I, just because so there's a little bit of a difference between medical grade what you're going to find in a hospital where they use it for diabetes and things like that, and and wound care, and what you're going to get at restore hyper wellness. It's it's sub medical grade. It's not exactly right. the same. Um, but it is, you know, the version that we can access as civilians, I guess I would say. And um, it's super, just super beneficial. And so they, what they typically do um, is, I mean, you can choose how frequently you go, but they also do packages. So if you are going to try it, I would recommend if you can go in and be very consistent to actually see what benefit it can give you. Right, right. Absolutely. Do you remember actually um, just... I'm going to throw you on the spot here and maybe we'll have to delete this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do you remember the name of that charity that helps uh, the veterans and they use? Yeah, it's a, it's America's mightiest warriors. And it's uh, it was founded by the mother of a Navy SEAL, Mark Lee, who was killed in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And um, she has, you know, through her travels of, or through her journey of dealing with her son's loss, she, she recognized that a lot of veterans are you know facing PTSD and there's the suicide epidemic and and things like that and and so she offers a, she has it runs a charity that gets help for uh, veterans and there's a lot of things they offer but one of the things they do offer in there is is uh, is um, hyperbaric and that's super unique right but right. they're seeing a lot of benefit from it absolutely yeah yeah okay yeah. what's the name of it again America's Mightiest Warriors dot org that work. All right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I want to make sure we mention that because that's yeah. pretty cool. I, I love stuff cool. like that. Yeah. So if you're just uh, 
a normal person. Uh, I don't, I'm sure that there are other places, but what we're familiar with is Restore Hyper Wellness. They have a franchise, just go to restore.com and you can put in your zip code and um, check out and see if they have one locally. All right. So the next thing that we were going to talk about, and these are to- two totally different topics, totally separated. That's okay. We're going to mush them into one episode. Yeah. Um, the second thing is, why we personally, and not everybody agrees with this, mm-hmm. but why we personally found benefit for the 90 days of celibacy. Yeah. So yeah. you want to talk about like why it's recommended and sure. like your side of it? So I think, um, you know, I, I think it was my therapist that had recommended it mm-hmm. to to me. Within, I was all over that. I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I think it was in like week two or something like that. I mean, he was, he was, he was pretty on the spot with it. And so the, the whole premise there, you know, for, for the addict is to, and and when they say, you know, you know, celibacy, that's not just not having sex with your partner. You know, that's not doing anything. You know, yeah. there's, there's no masturbation. There's, you know, not, 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 nothing like that. And the whole point there is to teach you that you are actually in control. And so, and so you, and you have to sit with those emotions when you feel like acting out or whatever that is. And so, you know, that's 90 days, 90 days is three months. And it doesn't seem like that's a long time, but it's a long time when you're coming out of addict mode. Right. Well, it also has that 90 days also has to do with resetting those brain chemicals too, because you really establish certain patterns. Right. And that I believe the 90 days has to goes into kind of resetting that chemical cascade as well. Absolutely. And and so like, I remember he cautioned me, he was like, well, between about 21 and 28 days, you're really going to. You're going to feel, you know, some really deep things. And, and I, you know, if I, if I can recall, I don't think I felt anything in the first month. There was things that I felt beyond. I remember feeling empty at various points through that 90 days. And I think that's just, you know, there was a lot going on in our relationship too, you know. And, and, you think yeah. that was your version of withdrawal because you, yeah. I remember you distinctly talking me, talking to me about those times, there was nothing necessarily that triggered that. Right. But I think right. that was your version of withdrawal was yeah. that you have these weird sort of, I feel empty. Um, my guess would be, <laughs> I could be totally wrong. Yeah. But my guess would be that that was your body kind of trying to trigger you for a dopamine hit. Uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, you know, it, it, it was doing that, but I, you know, I tell you, it really had a, it really had a positive effect. Um, you know, the, the, you, you could, you learn that when you're intimate and, and, you know, without sharing too much, but you and I were intimate a few times through that where we did not have, there was no intercourse or anything like that. Um, but it wasn't about me. And so I remember thinking as that, as that happened, like how powerful that was and how rewarding that was necessarily for me from a, not from a, you know, like a dopamine hit or anything like that, but it was like, Hey, you don't need to you know, you don't need to do anything. Your body, if your body is, is, you know, is going to get rid of something, it either absorbs it or it expels it. And we'll just talk around in circles. So if you can understand all of the uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> reading between the lines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's things like nocturnal emissions and yeah. things like that. And and so, you know, your body, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't need it. You know, you don't, I think that's the mystery. Just come to but, completion. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, you don't need it. I mean, you, you, you really you know, don't this whole cultural thing that like sex is a need Mm -hmm. it's not it's not a biologically need you need air you need water you need food right right yeah those are your biological needs sex is not a biological need it's a desire Mm -hmm. and the healthy version that god gave us is that it comes out of um an emotional intimacy that then transitions into physical intimacy and it's you know it's okay to want it you know, it right. really is okay to want it in, in in the healthiest of forms, and and so so I think you know what what was interesting is is I just remember a lot of my own thought processes were like, wow, this is really interesting. But I do remember like like I don't I don't need it, and it was really from a um, from a uh, starting to shape my view of myself post discovery. That goes into sorry, just to interrupt you really quickly. That goes. It was in- a really important point. And- no, what I was saying is that goes into the identity discussion that we had Absolutely. a couple yeah. days ago, yeah. because the way you were speaking to yourself through this is so different. Like I hear so many times, like just the perspective around this is so 
abusive and so selfish a lot of times Mm -hmm. where the guys are like, oh, this is a need that I have. How can I do this? And, you know, it's her job as my wife and all this kind of stuff. Right. Right. So again, it goes into the, you're stepping into an identity of, I actually don't need this. This is not who I am. Who I am is somebody that has self-control and is working towards recovery. And this, and, and actually going through this process is empowering. Yeah, it it really is. Yeah. And and I remember, I remember approaching the 90 days being like, is this going to be something where we're just going to end up having like sex at 90? Like I was kind of confused and yeah, we didn't. And, um, and it was, it was fine. And it was like, okay. And I, you know, like you just, you just kind of move through it. And so it's, it's a little bit of a training program, Mm -hmm. you know, for your head and, and, you know, for your mind and your brain and, and things like that to to make you understand that you're not some, some mindless sex addicted idiot. Right. Again, goes into the identity that, that essentially is what men are taught Mm -hmm. that like you have a monkey brain. That is not able to be controlled. Right. Sex is what controls the monkey brain. Mm-hmm. And once sex is offered or available to you, you have no self-control whatsoever. It yeah. just has to happen. Yeah. Right? right. And it, it's like, that is not, it's so frustrating. Um, I have so much more respect for men than that, honestly, than, yeah. than the yeah. way the culture talks. Yeah. About. We're, we're, we're much more capable, much better. We yeah. owe it to ourselves to give ourselves a positive message that we, you know, you know, men always like to think they're in control. And imagine the the, uh, the the power from going against a poor society, a message that tells you that you're not in control at this point, right. but you are in control and you can actually learn to be in control too. Mm-hmm. That's you know, even after the worst of the worst right. you know, behavior, you absolutely can be in control. With this addiction, you have multiple things at play. Mm-hmm. You have the emotional wounds that trigger. You right. have the right. physiological Um, chemical cascade process once it's an addiction that's Mm -hmm. going to kind of trigger certain mechanisms in your body Mm -hmm. and the inhabits and and stuff like that. And then you also have free will and choice. Right, right. And as you are going through recovery, what you're doing is learning how to optimize all of those. So you're calming the chemical cascade, Mm -hmm. you are addressing and dealing with the emotional wounds, and then you are learning how to develop self-control, which becomes, correct me if I'm wrong, Easier and easier and easier as the chemical cascade oh, dies yeah. down and as the emotional wounds are actually right. processed. Well, you know, by by just just through process, you know, it takes you know, you're, you're you're done with the chemical cascade, chemical addiction uh, point of it at 90 days, probably somewhat earlier than that. The wound healing piece takes years. Sure. And, and so and, and the reason it takes years is because you it, it takes you time to connect the dots and to recognize that something was a wounding event and and to understand your maybe your role in that or your parents or the your people who you love very much. And you have to kind of recognize, well, man, I, I really love them. They didn't mean to hurt me. You know, with that both and well, no, but they did, yeah. and and so and did the absolute best that they could. Absolutely, and yeah, they made mistakes. Yeah, and and so you know, and much like we we have wounded the people we love. You know, I mean, I think, I, and that's the other part that comes about through this healing journey. Is you're like, wow, I actually hurt a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, I hurt Keegan, and I hurt hurt my brothers, and I probably hurt wounded my parents, and I certainly hurt you. And mm-hmm. and so, like, you know, you you start to to reconcile with that, but then you also recognize, yeah, but everybody does that to everybody. Yeah. You, know, you know what it's I mean? Like it's it's not condition. it's not a Pat Terhoon thing that I have yeah. to go pay penance for you know for that. But um, so yeah, I think I think the you know the ninety days was powerful because it was just a step in that direction of starting to take your life back and live in a manner that that you you wanted to live that mm-hmm. you want to live and and so and, and I think it it you know it allowed me to be more present mm-hmm. and more. Um, you know, you know, intimacy, you know, sex is just a small part of couple intimacy. It's a very small part of it. And so sometimes what happens is through these things is sex becomes, you know, in, in unhealthy viewpoints and unhealthy behavior. Sex is intimacy. Well, yeah, I have it, to, uh, in know. order to be connected to you, I have to have sex with you. Right. Right. And yeah. that's like, no, if that, if that's the direction, if that's coming from the opposite direction, what is actually right. healthy, it's Absolutely. supposed to be yeah. an expression right. and outpouring. Whereas sometimes you see guys, sorry, I mean, it's just it's typically men, maybe you sometimes it's women, no, <laughs> maybe <kidding>. it's <laughs> but typically it's men that you see like on social media and stuff saying, well, that's how, that's how I connect to my wife. And it's like, right. no, if you're yeah. looking at sex as the primary means of connecting to your wife, you're missing the entire point. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, so, you know, connection is 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 hugging. It's holding hands. It's falling asleep together. It's you know, it's it's being friends. It's, it's community. It's, like, it's having conflict, healthy yeah. conflict at times. I mean, that's intimacy too. I mean, and and, and sometimes yeah, yeah. People sometimes forget that. How oh, I keep arguing with my wife. Like, well, you know, sometimes you go through periods in your marriages where things may not be as lovey dovey as as they always are, and that's part of it. But if you stay committed to each other and committed to to kind of pushing through. I think I, I heard somewhere the other day that like when you talk to a couple that's been together 50 or 60 years or whatever, that they'll always go, yeah, our third decade was a hard one, you know, or <laughs> something like that. And it's just because that's the nature of things, you know, people change. That's what you're talking about. We don't ever fight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, but you know, this was a hard period, <laughs> no, right? So hard. we're going to look back on this period and go, boy, that was hard. This you is our painful I mean? decade. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, and, and, you know, that's, that's, that's not unique to a couple. It is part and parcel of every successful life. Couple. Yeah. Life, human right, existence. Right. And so you're gonna go through these periods where you disagree and, right. and you know and stuff like that. But if you're moving in a direction that's healthy. And, and and so I think I think this 90 day thing was really important for me to do, but I think it also held a lot of respect for you because you weren't you would be worried. I remember you saying this, you were like, you would be worried what would come into my head if something like that was going on. And so it kind of, it, it clarify that. What are you talking about? So like, if I'm, you know, if I'm in the process and we're doing something mm-hmm. and we're being sexually intimate. Oh, learning and, what was popping into your head. Yeah. So you're, you were, yeah, so you're like, were, right. So you're worried about that. You're like, Oh my gosh. If, you know, if, let's say he has an orgasm. In this, the 90 days, what happens if you have, yeah. yeah. And I think that still came up and occasionally you'll ask that question, you know, and stuff like Does nothing ever come up or anything, you know, you know, or it, images popping into yeah. your head. Yeah, or, yeah, right, right. And so I think I think it's, you know, it it's you, you you've talked a, a few, you've mentioned that point about having safety. And and so I think it's just I think there's a lot of positive that comes from it helps helps put some brackets around safety that aren't fully assured, but it puts some brackets around it. It teaches the guy that that he's not a mindless idiot, that he can control himself. And that's very empowering for right. somebody who's coming out, you know, who's very ashamed. Disempowered from the addiction. Yeah, very ashamed yeah. of what he's done and, and seeing the hurt on people's faces and the disbelief. And well, and even that. the way, and we talked about this a little bit with the identity episode, even the way culturally addiction is talked about, it's disempowering. It's like, well, this addiction is going to have control over you and you're just going to have to be subject to it. So be prepared. And it's like, no, that's not true. And so being able to complete something like this successfully, you know, goes into that choosing that identity, that empowerment of you that, no, I'm actually in control. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting is um, the, uh, my therapist said it, said it best. So addiction patterns are like train tracks. And if you have a high speed train running down that thing eight times a day, it, you know, there's going to be no grass on that thing. Those rails are going to be super shiny. Well, as soon as, as soon as the train stops going down that, those rails are going to start to rust, uh, you know, uh, uh, growth is going to grow up between the rails and it's mm-hmm. going to do all of those things. And over time, it's going to get deeper and deeper, but those rails are still there in a little bit. In in and so you always have to be constantly looking out for it. And I think, you know, the, you know, what he said to me, he goes, you know, you just have to be careful because if you go back down that, that if you send the train down that path again, um, it doesn't take long for it to get worn and shiny again. Yep. So, you know, that's the thing. So, you know, when we talk about, well, what's the work you do in the two to five years and you, you learn to sit in that emotion, you mm-hmm. learn to sit there and go, I feel really sad because I had a negative interaction with a coworker mm-hmm. or a family member, or I'm just not as connected with my wife. But it doesn't mean I got to go do something stupid. It just means that I'm I'm feeling feeling off. And in like in those processes, what you're doing is creating the new train track that then right. becomes as shiny and as easy to go down. That's the well maintained track yeah. at that point. It yeah, becomes yeah, easier, yeah, right? And you know, and then at some point, like they do in America, they'll turn it into a walking path, and it'll have watering fountains on it, and like. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. That was a weird tangent. Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Goldfish pond. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Um. Okay, so there's a couple of things I want to talk about this. So that was primarily from your perspective, calming the brain patterns, feeling empowered, mm-hmm. um, knowing that you can do it, um, that sort of thing. From my perspective as the spouse, that provided a level of safety for me. Mm-hmm. Because when when you're learning about sex addiction, you, you do kind of get pulled into this, well, are they just like sex crazed? Like, and and women like just say, like, if 
the, every individual that goes through this process has to make their own choices. So some women feel comfortable doing their own 90 days of celibacy. Some women don't, they feel put upon by that. Like, why do I have to suffer for your bad behavior? Mm -hmm. Right. And so everybody kind of has to find their own version of this. I would think knowing what we know about the brain and resetting and all that kind of stuff and everything that you just shared, finding a way that the man can be celibate for 90 days would be really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, we found benefit for that. Um, And a lot of people and therapists recommend that. Mm -hmm. Um, However, that doesn't mean that the wife has to be celibate for 90 days. So um, without going into too much detail, um, you know, I actually think that can be really healthy where the, the guy kind of were alluding to this earlier, but basically like you are spending time with your wife um, (laughs) without being crass, taking care of her and um, you know, there's nothing that happens with your physical body. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I'm sorry. The, the, the addiction is a selfish thing. Mm-hmm. Not, and, you know, this is not intended to shame anybody who's, who's in addiction. But it's, it's very self-focused. Mm-hmm. And so when you can learn to be present and give, you know, that's a that's a step in in a healing direction. Mm-hmm. And so in, well, in, in any way. And, in, in, and from the spouse perspective, and I don't know if any women or, or guys who are betrayed partners, but betrayed spouses. I don't know if, um, if this would be the same, but you know, we're having to navigate a lot of triggers around sex because of your behavior. Mm -hmm. And so having it kind of be shut down for a period of time was very helpful for me because there's a lot that it was like, okay, well, if you get aroused, for a long time, that was kind of triggering to me because I was like, well, that's part and parcel with daily activities that were, you know, betraying me. Um, And there were different things that we kind of had to navigate within that relationship Mm -hmm. where I was like this, you know, the words that you're using as we interact might be triggering or that. So there's just, there's a lot of words. words. There are a lot of landmines when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. And while you're trying to get your feet underneath you to deal with like, what the heck is betrayal? What the heck is addiction? Is he going to stay sober? Is he you know, going to, uh, remain faithful to me. Mm -hmm. The first 90 days are full of so many landmines. I just feel like for me, it was helpful to take that off while we were processing it. Right. Like this is not something that I have to worry about while I'm worrying about figuring out all of these other things. Mm -hmm. Cause it was such a flood of information Yeah. as I was learning about what was happening to my body, what was happening to you. I was jumping into how can we support you? Like we talked about in the past couple episodes, like how can we make sure that your brain is on track? Mm -hmm. And then eventually saying, okay, you're seeming to be stable. How can I help myself now? Because now I'm really struggling. Right. And so not having that be a pressure was really helpful. Um, I want you to, because I think you navigated this part really, really well. So I would like maybe for you to share your perspective on, uh, how do I say this, communicating to your wife during this period of time, Um, because you were very, very much from day one, you were on board with sex is not a need. I want you to feel safe. I want you to feel comfortable. I want you to feel respected. I will never pressure you no matter what happens. If I want it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, and the bound, any boundary that I put in place, maybe plus some, were always respected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the way we communicated about this was very intentional. And then every step progressing to more after the 90 days mm-hmm. was something that we talked about and was very intentional and very, very safe. There was never any pressure, never any coercion, never any... You know, because I was struggling with recognizing, and I think any betrayed partner is going to struggle with this. How the heck do you view sex? What the heck do you think love is, right? Like, these are the questions that I asked you. Like, what does it mean? Like, how is it different than what you were doing with these other women? Like, how is, you know, all of these things are going through my head. So my ultimate goal moving towards actual intimacy Mm -hmm. was that we don't rush into anything, make mistakes with it. and, And because of that, slow down or even miss the ultimate goal altogether. My goal was like, if we're going to do this, if we're going to recover, I want to do it right. And I want to achieve this 
what seemed almost impossible and like esoteric, like spiritual, romantic, energetic connection that should be sexuality. Mm-hmm. And I and, and just so everybody knows that doesn't happen at day 91. Oh my gosh, no. Yeah. But that's what I wanted to progress towards, right? right. And what what leads to that and what creates that for me mm-hmm. was this really intentional, safe foundation that we were very, to be honest, slow and careful and conscientious about. Yeah. And and that it was very it was very structured and yeah. very strong, but you played a huge role in that. And so I want you to talk about your perspective on, you know, my boundaries, I think were maybe very different than a lot of women because mm-hmm. of my sexual trauma and the traumas that I brought into the relationship and, mm-hmm. and the level of defense and fear that I had around this. And so from your perspective as a guy, as an addict, as my husband, like how did you navigate that? Because I mean, you are always super conscientious about it. So well, that's a that's a multi layered question. With a, um, so I think I think the first thing and we talked about this early on in one of our early episodes is I never wanted to hurt you again, right? I recognized that I had hurt you, and I think it you know it takes time to kind of realize the depth and things like that. So I did not want to hurt you again. That was like number one, and and we've talked about this as well. Like I felt like. My re, you know, I felt I learned pretty early on that I was going to be pretty solid in recovery and that I was going to make it happen. My own personal ability to not engage in this behavior was, you know, as the days progressed into tens and a hundred or whatever, I felt very good about that. I felt like the process was there. What I was was uncertain of is whether the relationship would survive. But I resolved in my head, I said, I I don't. If the relationship doesn't survive, I want it to be because you say, you know, you really, really hurt me. You're really, really working hard, but I just can't get over that. I did not want to hurt you again Mm -hmm. and hurt you again and hurt you again. Mm -hmm. And so that was really my mindset that kind of came in. So I guess it's multi-pronged, right? Fix myself, get into recovery and do whatever I could to provide some safety for you and some say, you know, whatever that, whatever that may be. And I wanted to be in the relationship. You know what I mean? I, I really did. It wasn't like I was just doing this to go Are through sure? the motions. Because everyone on TikTok, when I came out with a story, mm-hmm. yeah. well, <laughs> was you know, convinced that you did not want to be in the yeah. relationship. No, I, I really, really did. And, 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 you know, I thought, and, you know, you and I would talk about this, like, I really liked our relationship, you mm-hmm. know, before. And, and that's what made it made this such an anguishing thing because it was like, what am I doing? You know, and I think people who have never been there, I I don't think are really going to fully understand that. You know what I mean? I think it's like, well, if you really, really love her, why didn't you just stop? And you're like, well, once, once the addiction was in place, it it, it needed to take public um, in the open, no secrets kind of work to do, to, to break the addiction. And, And I know that now, I mean, as much as I, as I sometimes go, gosh, I wish I had just been able to, you know, you know what I mean? Like, like it just, it was gone. It was, you know, that, that the ability to self-control was gone. Mm -hmm. And so I think relying on those fundamentals as we moved into this part of, and there was a lot of difficulties, like there was words I couldn't use yet. You wanted me to flirt with you. Mm -hmm. And so and flirting comes when you're feeling loose and open. Like, yeah, it's like, like, how could you be a sex addict and turn it off completely? And like, do you find me attractive? But wait, like, I don't want pressure to have sex, but I want to like, know that you want to have sex. with me. I mean, there are so many it's so weird right, to navigate. Right. And, and, it's and so I, think I, I think I learned through that. I think I think I remember, and I think I've said this to you a couple of times, like, I will never hurt you in that way again. I may say things wrong. I may miss <laughs> I may things. Make mistakes. Yeah, I may. And, and so I think once I learned that, you know what I mean? Because I was trying to be everything. I think what I was, you know, it's, it's almost like the opposite. I wanted to be the, the superhero available. It's almost an addiction mindset. You know, like, like I want to be everything that I can ever be to, to you and in every way. And, and, and you can't, it's impossible. No human being can do that. But I was committed to that. You know, like if, if I remember thinking at length, like, what does she mean to flirt? How could I mm. do that? And I remember well, thinking about those things. Because yeah. like you said, it does take relaxation. And now where we are in recovery, it's like way more natural. And it's just sort of, 
it's an outpouring, right? It's and, a normal. Right. And actually, response. to be honest with you, like, like there are certainly change behaviors in my mind, but there are things that I do now that I think I even did then, but you take them as flirting now. You just weren't ready to be flirted yeah, sure. with. It was more of a reaction to be like, hey, I, you know. So, yeah. so I think, you know, I, I, uh, it's okay just for everybody. I, like, everybody's I, pace absolutely. is different. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, wherever that boundary is at mm-hmm. whatever point, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, when you ask, like, you know, why, why was I so good in this? Is, is I really, you know, it's I respectful to me, I guess. Yeah. I was so, I was so, um, I did not want to hurt you anymore. I did not want to inflict new harm mm-hmm. on you. And I knew, I guess I, I you know, whatever, it was, maybe it's my, my mom and dad that thought, you know what I mean? But I just did not want to inflict that again on you. And I think, I think I was smart enough to recognize that, that, you know, that would inflict more harm, mm-hmm. you know, demanding things or yeah. complaining or whatever. I mean, I, I, I think I tried really, really hard to never complain. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's a couple of things. It's like, you know, well, you were it, never really like that anyway. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I owned it. I mean, I, I really, you know, you and I talked about this. It was never anybody's fault. You know, even my traumas, it's, it's how I reacted to the traumas. You know what I mean? My traumas weren't anybody's fault either. You know what I mean? In a lot of ways, you know, like I, I had a responsibility to myself to try to go process those correctly. Mm-hmm. And you don't know. And granted, maybe I, you know, maybe there, maybe there was, that couldn't be helped, but you know, you still always have a responsibility to yourself to, to find a way to make yourself more healthy. And I think that's the life's journey. You know, you, you know, if it's sanctification as a Christian, you know, to, to move closer. Um, but you also have a responsibility as a, as a human being, then hopefully you're, you know, you're, you're, you're better in your fifties than you were in your forties and better in your sixties than your fifties. You know, you lose some physical attributes mm-hmm. just from the, the, but hopefully your mind is sharper. Mm-hmm. Hopefully your relationships are better. Hopefully. And so like, I, I really felt, um, that, and I also felt this too, and you and I have talked about this, that, getting into recovery was a gift Mm -hmm. and I did not want to squander that gift. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, there was, so it's kind of a multi-layered answer to your question, but I, you know, I think I was very, very, you know, I think, um, I think, I think I knew inherently knew what safety looked like. Mm -hmm. And so what was hard though, and I think this would trigger you is there was a little bit of codependence that you called me out on. I remember this in the first couple of weeks of, being a little bit like, well, I was fishing for compliments mm-hmm. and there were no compliments. And I think, I, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, I mean, and yeah. that's okay. And, and you're know, like, logically, I, I I knew there shouldn't be compliments. Yeah. Oh, well, I would say things like, I'm not going to compliment you for doing the right thing. Like, yeah. good job. Like, right. you're not cheating on me. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. Like, congratulations. You stayed yeah. faithful for 10 days. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I remember saying things like that because it's like, no, I'm not going to. I tried very hard to support you. I mm-hmm. would go in. I would check off the days with you. I would yeah. give you a hug. You know, I, I was very much like pro you getting into recovery, but I yeah. also was not going to just overly celebrate the fact that you're doing the right thing now right you know good, yeah. good for you you know yeah. you should have been doing this the entire 10 years we were together yeah. you know and i think you know? i think a lot of times guys will look to their wives for that and and they're not going to get it if, mm-hmm. especially if they've hurt their wives and that's why the group experience is so important is, is you got to get you know like if a guy calls me and yeah. says hey i'm 10 days in i'm going to be like hey you're awesome yeah days. yeah like but his wife may not you know and so we are that's the thing we are dealing with our own pain right so i'm trying i'm over there trying to support you while you know, 10 days in great job. I just realized you cheated on me for 10 years. So, you know, empathy for that person Mm -hmm. while you are going up with your energy and your self-empowerment and your, you know, sobriety and all this kind of stuff, we are still processing the reality of what just happened. Yeah. Yeah. So back, but back to the 90 days, I think one thing that I've I think would be helpful to make very clear Mm -hmm. is communication is absolutely key. You have to be talking about how you're feeling, how you think about sex, all this kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. what the betrayed partners boundaries are, why they are there, how they're feeling about everything. Um, I don't really think you can over communicate in these situations. Mm -hmm. Um, And for the addicted partner, just being willing to, have that conversation very openly, very honestly, and respect where that boundary is. And then also like, you know, I think sometimes people are like, well, it's either sex or no sex. Well, like there's a lot of levels, right? There's There's a lot lot of different options. So you can kind of find what works for you. Like if you as the betrayed partner are like, well, I feel like this is a punishment for me, but also I feel like it's really important for the husband as, you know, to to go 90 days and to have all of those benefits that you just shared, 
there is an in-between, right? Like that we kind of talked about. So like, there's a lot of ways to make it work depending on your level of trauma, the type of relationship you have, Mm -hmm. what you're willing to do or not do. Um, You know, but I will say, and and I don't mean to sound sound, um, negative in any way when I say this, for the betrayed partner wanting sex, um, just be careful and conscientious about maybe why that is. Absolutely. Because if that is codependent or that is... Um, coming from an unhealthy feel, need. Right. You feel like you need to replace the pattern. If you're replacing the pornography, yeah. Yeah. if you're afraid he's going to relapse, if you're not having sex with him, mm-hmm. those may be unhealthy things that those emotional wounds in yeah. you um, are something to be addressed, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's the opposite, right? Like I I was very much not a jump jump into having sex very quickly. I was, mm-hmm. I'm like way far the opposite, right? Like, let's go really slow, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And there are, there's a spectrum for sure. Mm-hmm. And then there's also really just like the addict needs to process their emotional wounds and why they make decisions and, and how they're mm-hmm. feeling. We do too. So whatever decision we're making, I think it's really important to understand where is that coming from? Why are we making it? Yeah. And what is our goal with making that? Because if you don't know why you want to have sex with someone, that might be a question worth asking. Yeah, yeah. There's a uh, there's a uh, scale that that you kind of check in on your, on your feelings every day, and and it's so healthy for both both for actually all people in general. Yeah, because that, that, that's what, but it's identifying your feelings. So what are you feeling today, and can you can you place the reason on that? You mm-hmm. know, and I, you know, I'm feeling like I really need, let's say, the betrayed spouse. I really need sex today, and you know, you're with this guy who just betrayed you, and, and whatever. Like, well, is that healthy? And that's hard. I mean, because yeah. it goes into the depth of that. You know, if, if a guy, if the betrayer is like, man, I really, really need sex today. Well, why? Is it just because you're coming off of this, mm-hmm. this dopamine, dopamine hit thing? Or is it you're really starting to feel connected to your wife? And, and you know, and, and, and everyone yeah. is allowed to say no. Everyone. And I think sometimes, you know, like I had to learn that too. Like, like it's okay for me to say, I'm just not in that space right now. Mm-hmm. And so, Why you're a sex addict? You should want it all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and I and I remember you saying like some things along those yeah. lines, and well, and I remember you were trying to figure it out, right? right? Yeah. Like, Wait, why are you not? Yeah. You know, and it was hard to hear. Things. It was hard to hear that, and I think I actually remember telling you, and I think I I've said this before. I was like, I didn't like that guy. Yeah. I well, it's like a very him. that perspective of while well, he was a sex addict, he should want it for me all the time. Mm-hmm. It's a very normal response, but it's also it's coming from a very unhealthy place. Right. Right. So you know, what you're working towards is the healthy perception of sex, the emotional intimacy, the connection to each other, that foundation of safety. And um, when you're in the very beginning, the first 90 days or even the first six months, like our emotions are everywhere Mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure things out and we don't know what's happening. And so like, you know, our brain is going to go to all these different places Mm -hmm. trying to figure things out. Absolutely. Yeah. You're going to ask a lot of questions and sometimes you may ask the same questions over and over again. You know, I, 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 I always, I always laughed about this is, you know, I was sleeping downstairs and, and I really need my sleep. I mean, and I'm, I go to sleep early and I wake up early and stuff. And it was, you know, it's the joke is like, it'd be 10 o'clock at night. And you'd be like, Hey, I have a couple of questions. It was like, Oh, boy. I don't think it was quite that dramatic. Yeah. But, yeah, but I mean, sure. that's how it felt. And yeah. it was like, and, and the answers would take an hour. Right. And the processing. And it was like, Ooh. And, and I remember at one point I was like, Hey, we, we can't do this at, at 9 30, 10 o'clock. Yeah. We had to bump it early. But yeah. This was like months in like, in yeah. The- in the survival phase mm-hmm. of the first couple of days and weeks, anything kind of went to and I, trying and, to figure it out. Right. And, and I remember once I got to that point, I was like, I'll, you know, I'll answer any question you have. Right. I remember making that, that, that statement too, you know? And yeah. so, so that, you know, anyway. So, okay. We got way off topic there, but, yeah. um, but it's okay. Um, we like our little tangents. Yeah. Um, good thoughts. Anything else about 90 days, benefits, pros, cons? No, no. Just that. It's very beneficial. Very beneficial. And I would seriously, strongly consider it. Yep. Same. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast interesting or helpful, it would mean so much if you leave a five-star review or post a screenshot and share on social media. We are on a mission to share the message of recovery and you can help get the word out. If you know a friend who could use this podcast, please share it.